At the height of the Industrial Revolution in 1891, when Catholic workers were leaning toward the ideas of Marx and socialism to find their dignity and voice, Pope Leo XIII, who studied under Taparelli, published a letter to the whole church on the topics of capital and labor. He called it Rerum Novarum, in English, of new things. In it, he rejected the popular ideas of both socialism and capitalism while defending labor unions and private property. He stated that society needed to be based on cooperation and not class conflict and unfair competition. The Pope taught that the role of the state is to promote social justice through the protection of basic human rights. He said, the economy must serve people, not the other way around. People are more important than things Labor is more important than capital. For over a hundred years since Rerum Novarum, succeeding popes have addressed the issues put forward in this document. If you ask a number of people today to define social justice, you'll hear many different responses. Their definitions will be based on a variety of factors like political orientation, religious background, and political and social philosophy. The tenets of social justice go beyond simple charity that encourages us to help the poor, being for others, but also to address the conditions that keep them poor, being with others. As Rerum Novarum states, people have a right to economic initiative and private property. But these rights have limits. No one is allowed to amass excessive wealth when others like the basic necessities of life. Some call that communist or socialist. Social justice is neither. It is a theme of liberation that has its roots deep within the Gospels. The moral test of any society is how it treats its most vulnerable members. The poor have the most urgent moral claim on the conscience of the nation. When instituting public policy, we are asked as Christians that the preferential option for the poor be always kept at the forefront of the decision-making process. Social justice is not in opposition to the gospel message. It is the gospel message. The challenge of social justice is easy to misunderstand until one sees who Jesus hung out with, the least of our brothers and sisters. The working class, His Holiness felt, was fighting a war on two fronts, the first with their increasingly corrupt employers and secondly with the rising tide of socialism. It's important to note the now antiquated definition of socialism he uses means only the abolishment of private property. He therefore begins his letter to the church by addressing the issue of personal property and its necessary preservation as a right. His reasoning goes as follows. Man has a natural right to private property and not only personal property because he has ongoing needs. He needs not only the fruit of the soil, but the soil itself, such that he might reap the fruits of future labor. When disposing the fruits of remunerative labor, man may buy goods or private property, the abolishment of which lessens the freedom to dispose of said fruits, and, quote, thereby of all hope and possibility of increasing his resources and bettering his condition in life, end quote. A chief point of distinction between animal and man is that man has more than the two instincts of self-preservation and propagation that drive him. He must have a right to stable and permanent possession because he has the reason and power to exercise control over them. Nature has, accordingly, given to man substance to fulfill his ongoing need. We see that Pope Leo XIII declares four conditions for this unalienable right. The first is a reason to exercise it. The second, a power to exercise it. The third, nature's provision of it, 
and fourth, its consistency with divine law. This fourth condition is only implied in his writing. For example, we have, often, both a reason and a power to exercise control over our fellow man, which nature has provided before us. But this does not make a carte blanche for our mastery over them. A case that illustrates this point is, let's say I need a doctor, and I was in a position to force this man into my service and treat me. I have already met the first three conditions, but I would have defied the fourth of divine law, namely the seventh commandment, even if I paid him fairly to treat me after the fact. This is something that Pope Leo XIII will expand on later in this encyclical when we talk about consent between the worker and the employer. The next issue he addresses is the family as a society, writing, The family is a society of a man's house. It is one older than any state, and it has rights and duties peculiar to itself which are quite independent of outside influences. He attaches this to the issue of private property by accurately noting that a family itself has the right to self-preservation. So when a worker does dispose of his wages to buy private property or means, he is preserving and continuing his family through allowing his offspring and his continuation more stability. He then addresses the question of the nature of employer-employee relations in what would be a proper and Christian arrangement. He outlines five rights and duties of the worker. The first is to fully and faithfully perform the work which has been freely and equitably agreed upon. The second is to never injure the property nor to outrage the person of an employer. The third is to never resort to violence in defending their own cause. The fourth, never to engage in riot or disorder. And the fifth, never having anything to do with men of evil principles, which means men who excite foolish hopes, troublemakers. Next comes the six rights and duties of the employer, the first of which is not to look upon his workmen as bondsmen, but to respect every man and his dignity as a person ennobled with Christian character. The second is the employer is bound to see that the worker has time for his religious duties, namely going to church on Sundays and other obligations. Three, that the worker must not be exposed to corrupting or dangerous influences and occasions. Fourth, that he may not be led away to neglect his home or family or squander his earnings. Five, that the employer must not tax his work people beyond their faculties. And six, is to religiously refrain from cutting the workman's earnings. It is these conditions, His Holiness argues, that not only set the moral framework for work, but increase the fruits of production and therefore benefit society at large. A duty for both parties, not enforced by human law, but by the laws and judgment of Christ, is to give to the poor. We have a duty to share a large portion of our temporal blessings with others beyond what is required to live and sustain our living condition. The Church intervenes on the behalf of the poor by setting up and sustaining associations which help them. She is the common bridge between the rich and the poor. She allows the poor to keep their dignity by not forcing them to beg for their physiological needs. Though unrelated, I thought it right to include a thought from His Grace Archbishop Cordiglione, who says that beyond their physical sustenance, an essential need for beauty is also fed almost exclusively by the Church. The foremost duty of the State, however, should be to make sure that the laws and institutions are made to realize public well-being and private prosperity, particularly for the working class as the society is most dependent on it. The idea that wage earners and workmen must be specially cared for and protected by the government is a sentiment continuously repeated throughout the encyclical. He says, a state chiefly prospers through moral rule, well-regulated family life, respect for religion and justice, the moderation of fair taxes, the progress of arts and trade, and the abundant yield of the land. When legislating, the law must not overstep its mandate through any remedy that goes further than is needed to remove evil or mischief. Going back to the issue of the worker's duty of avoiding those who would seek to excite foolish hope, His Holiness here says that the law has a duty to intervene and restrain these firebrands to save his workers from strife and to maintain the peace. The only time the state should intervene in the payment of wages is when the master refused to pay the agreed wages or the worker fails to complete the agreed work but not under any other circumstances. A worker ought to be paid enough to reach self-preservation. If a worker accepts harder conditions because he is fearing a worse evil or through coercion, in legal terms this is called contract coercion, he is made the victim of force. 
The state therefore has a right to act in these cases and ensure that the wage earners are not abused. This is the issue of true consent among employers and their workmen. The policies of the state in creating an environment of prosperity should favor ownership as a means of creating a condition where the classes are brought nearer to one another. The product of a nation is increased as, quote, men always work harder and more readily when they work on that which belongs to them, end quote. He also argues that it would stop emigration out of a nation if the leaving man had a natural anchor in the form of an economic incentive to stay. Lastly, he advocates for the creation of working men's unions to replace the old trade guilds that have largely gone away. One, they promoted the advancement of arts, as numerous monuments remain to bear witness, and two, they deliver more rights to the workmen. The state's duty in the business of private associations, which are themselves small societies, is to secure their ability to function, but not to act on their behalf as they can be killed by the interference of a body outside of the organization as it takes from them the spirit that inspires them.